Yeah, that was the trailer for the 1981 film Escape to Victory starring Michael Caine, Pele and Sylvester Sloan. What a lineup! Kieran Bradley and Paul Moore join me on the line to discuss. How are you getting on, lads? Yeah, not too bad, not too bad no. I mean, when you read it out loud like that, it just uh, kind of dawns on you just how surreal it is. I've watched this film nearly every season, say, for my existence, as long as I remember football. But just when you hear those names out loud, it just still doesn't quite sink in. But yeah, looking forward to a, a chat on a, a classic of mine. Yeah, this is a film that I was forced to sit through as a kid when I was younger at Christmas time, like you, Paul. It's not something I remember fondly, but I, I rewatched it the last day. I actually really enjoyed it. I see the novelty of it, and I see why it is a classic Christmas film. Kieran Bradley, I think you were watching this for the first time as well this week, were you? Yeah, I was coming in fresh. Um, I yeah, I'm the same as you actually. I, I was I was pleasantly surprised. It's one of those films that you kind of know a few of the cultural references to, and the you know, kind of Pele bicycle gear and Bobby Moore and all this stuff. But I thought it was actually pretty well shot and enjoyed it a lot. Yeah. It's got such a weird cast, first of all, because you have Michael Caine, who's in his 40s. He's not exactly the Michael Caine now, where he's all suave and old and he's just a, a cuddly old man. He, you have Michael Caine at the, the edge of his stardom. You have Sylvester Stallone. 1981, this film came out, so this is the same time as the Rocky film. So arguably, he is the biggest movie star in the world right now. You have Pele, who is out of... Retire, near enough retirement age. I don't know what time, what age Pelly officially retired from playing football, but he was spending some time in Hollywood, uh, having spent some time in, a, in uh, the American Soccer League. So he's in this film. You have three World Cup winners in this film, and I will give five gold stars to Paul Moore or Karen Bradley if you can name the other two. Well, the other is Ozzy Ardiles and uh, Bobby Moore and Pelly. Yes, three yes. World Cup winners in the one film. And yet, the football in this film isn't great. You think? I mean... I think, I, think amongst, I think amongst Kane, who Ardina is the same said, he couldn't even run 20 yards, never mind kick a ball. So Kane, in terms of his football ability, is woeful. And you know what, lads? We could spend an hour on Sylvester Stallone alone because, Jesus <laughs> Christ, like, we'll get into it, but we, we have to work our way in. Um, I, the hot take is that everything that transpires in the film. You can make an argument that Stallone is really not needed for this and he's actually detrimental to the overall development of the team, but we'll get <laughs> on to that later. I have a theory as well that I think the footballers, uh, your Mike Summerbees, your uh, Russell Osmonds, they all get memory lines. Even Ireland's Kevin O'Callaghan, who was a, a winger for Ipswich, he would have been part of the, uh, uh, the Ipswich team, uh, John Walker there. He's five of the players in this, obviously, uh, who ended up uh, playing for the playing in the final match. Um, the footballers, I think, are better actors than the actors are footballers. That's not a bad shot. <laughs> the one thing yeah. I noticed about this film, and we'll get deeper into the football aspect of it later on in the show, but the one thing I noticed about this, and I'm not sure, Paul, you, having watched this uh, throughout your life, um, I've never really been able to figure out, is Pele's voice dubbed in this movie? Because I can't tell whether it's just the 1980 shot or if it actually looks, if, if he pre-recorded his lines and then acted out him saying those lines without actually saying them. Because it, it, it the sound seems a little bit off. Could have been, I'm not too sure, it could be ADR. So like a lot of films that we do, they film on the day, and maybe the audio doesn't sync to the, to the visuals. So they go back into the booth and maybe re-record the audio. But I'm pretty, I'm pretty certain that is Pele's actual voice. You I mean, he has the famous scene with, you know, when uh, Michael Caine's going through all the, the tactics and like, get the ball out wide. Don't dribble with it. You don't have the legs. You just give you the ball. And I'll go from here to here to here to here to here. <laughs> Goal. Good. Uh, and he has that, you know, uh, he, he's one of the players that's just in a half time. Like, don't go, Hatch. We need you. We can't win. So I'm pretty certain that fellow is wise. Although uh, his acting is pretty shady in other stuff I've seen him in. But I don't think he's the worst in this, if I'm perfectly honest. To be fair, he, he deserves the starring role in this. For everyone who hasn't seen this film, we are talking about Escape to Victory, or Victory as it originally came out as. And the film is basically about Allied prisoners of war in a prisoner of war camp in somewhere in Germany. And one of the German officers gets talking to Michael Caine, who is turn, turns out he is a former West Ham footballer, who his football career was sort of ruined by the, the war. So you have a, a bunch of players who previously played international football for England, Scotland, Wales and Ireland in this prisoner of war camp in Germany and they decide to have a football match. The idea behind it is that 
It'll give, it'll boost the morale of the British officers and the prisoners, and it will also work as a good propaganda machine for the German army as they absolutely trounce these prisoners, essentially, They're the former footballers who aren't in shape. So they, that's what the Germans think. That's not how it turns out, because in the background, Sylvester Stallone, who plays uh, an American uh, soldier that is in this camp, decides he wants to escape. So that's, that's where the escape comes. So there's a nice little background to this. Uh, the film originally, the, the storyline is based on a, a true story. It's not a true story. It turns out it's actually a myth, but it's a, a game that supposedly took place during World War II called The Death Match. It took place in Ukraine. The uh, Soviets had planned to put the Ukrainian uh, players up against the Germans, and the idea was that the, the Germans would try and some use this uh, match as a propaganda thing, but then the Ukrainians went out and thrashed the Germans 5-3 in a game, and then subsequently those Ukrainians were thrown in worker camps or prison camps. That didn't actually happen, but that's where the story comes from. It's a very good, it's a very good story. How well is it told, Kieran? Oh, reasonably. Like, uh, you have to give it um, a good bit of artistic license, but um, I, I, I quite enjoyed it. Sorry, it, ju it just occurred to me there when you said it was 5 3. I was like, I don't think any game before about 1970 finished nil nil. They always seem to be like 7 9 or all sorts. But um, I thought it was. Uh, my, my thoughts on it are that with any football film, any football related film, you it kind of exists in its own sphere because you go into it thinking this is a football film. So it's likely to be a little bit shit, frankly. Um, and once you allow for that, you kind of, you're, you're a little bit freed up by it. Um, I like, I liked it. I like the fact that Michael Caine is effectively playing Bobby Moore, um, given that he's a West Ham and England footballer already. Um, he's got the same complexion and kind of fair hair. Um, I thought Bobby Moore was actually a, a reasonably good actor in it too. Um, albeit he's, he's not, got that many speaking roles um it was shot nicely it, you know leaving aside the football scenes for the moment the it kind of went into that over of the, the the war film the kind of where eagles there and, and things like that there were a lot of nice shots and it seemed you know it was historically pleasing it might not have been historically kind of accurate um but yeah no i was i was pretty happy with it yeah, so essentially this is a mixture between The Great Escape and, I don't know, an, another film of that ilk. It's, it's basically, a, it's a football version of that. And anybody who grew up at a, at a certain time will just remember sitting down for war films or uh, westerns or whatever. This is, it, it, it sits there for me, including the brilliant soundtrack, which can be found on YouTube as well if you want to look that up. So John Huston is actually the director of this film. He has no association with uh, football films. He's actually, he's more of a serious director and this was a real step to the left for him. Uh, how do you think he got on, um, Paul? Because this was really him out of his comfort zone and as we know, having watched a couple of football films at this stage, that it's not an easy thing to bring football over to Hollywood and have it be pleasing, first of all, for the audience and also have that grasp of a bit of drama in it. Yeah, like, as you mentioned, Houston's reputation is, like, he's one of the most famous directors of, of all time. He's a two-time Oscar winner. He's made the likes of, like, The Action Queen, Pretty Donner, and he made The uh, Man Who Would Be King, which is uh, a bit of a cool classic as well, Michael Caine, uh, just for its endlessly quotable. And I think Rob Brydon's impression in that film is, is worth seeing alone. But no, I think I think it's actually, it's, it, it's a weird hybrid of films in that you have the kind of the prison break uh Plot line, which I think was kind of essential to keep the American audiences hooked in terms of a World War II drama. How you know you have your elevator pitch, what's the film like? Uh, you mentioned the score, which is Will Conti. He also did the music for Rocky, so Stallone would have known him as well through that iconic, uh, that iconic music, which is just as famous as, as anything else in that film. And he kind of clear every odds about the Elmer Bernstein, which is the guy who did music for The Great Escape, which you mentioned there. So it Houston knows kind of the nods to get and like. In these films, you expect certain things, you know. The one that kind of the big difference is that, and it's, 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 I'm not going to say troubling, but it is a bit unsettling in that they don't really go for the caricature in that piece. And I know Max Sido is a really, really good actor. Uh, God rest his soul, passed away not too long ago. But he kind of plays it with a, with a weird kind of, um, you can kind of empathise with him. But even, you know, when you see the tele overhead kick, 
he, he gets up and he, and he applauds and like, you know, I'm, I'm all about the purity of football and it's nothing to do with my, my politics. But you kind of have to remind that it's still, he's still a Nazi. Like, like there, I don't think there's enough you know, villainy there that was portrayed across. That's, that's the impression I got watching it again later. And oddly, the scene that kind of hit me, and I've seen it so many times, was the drama bit when, uh, when Colby, Michael Caine's character, is trying to get his list of players. And he essentially does a version of shooting the bits of football. He makes he calls for the Polish players and the Czech players who weren't uh, acknowledged by the Germans at the time by the, by the Nazis. And it was oddly moving when he get when they come up and they're kind of uh, skeletal and they're they're just that shot when they they been through the literal horrors of war and they're just standing there in front of him. So I think Houston does manage to get in those little bits of drama, which which is really to its credit because this is nothing more than an escapist three o'clock Sunday matinee film, but there are bits that stay with me. And then looking back on it now, there are bits that I find a bit baffling, like Stallone's detour to Paris really drags the pace of the film down. And ultimately, I know they made the moral decision to stay on and keep fighting, and it's a moral victory, but that whole plot line really doesn't pay off in any way, watch it with any shape or form, and it takes away from the overall theme of the film, which is, you know, triumph over adversity and, you know, spare the beautiful game and never give up and come back and all that stuff so before we even get on to the inaccuracies of what the football game is like i mean scoring three goals with 10 men i mean that will never happen but there are some odd tonal change twists in it but i think my overall impression is that the footballers do enough believable footballing uh, there's a better word there somewhere to make it believable the actors carry enough gravitas to say you believe it john ford directs this isn't his best film, but he's still an actor and director, so there's enough good cinematography. He knows how to work actors. And I mean, the credit to any director is if you believe, like you, you do buy, as you mentioned, Bobby Moore's good in the ballet's good in it. And I mean, any any director who can take a footballer and put them in a film and make them somewhat believable uh, is clearly has some passion for it. Because as we've seen in Goal and some certain cameos, it doesn't always work out that way with footballers. Yeah, and I. Totally agree with your point of the whole Sylvester Stallone going to Paris, bringing down the sort of pace of the film. It didn't pay off in any great way. We'll we'll return to that in a little bit later on the show. But I want to get into the cast first of all because it is a it is quite a big cast, and I I know Michael Caine has kind of got on to bigger and better things since this. But this was relatively young Michael Caine, who he would have been a big big British star, but in terms of stardom in the in the U.S., this would have been a big enough film for him at the time. I. I think he's quite good in this. Uh, he again, the similarities between him and Bobby Moore are obvious throughout the film. The relationship that he has with uh, Major von Steiner, who we'll talk about in a little bit as well, it is believable, and he does play a believable role. I think the balance between striking uh, a player who is happy enough just to see out the war, I think that he does that quite well, along with not wanting to show that as if he, he's happy in the camp. He, he, he doesn't want to escape, but he's not exactly content with living there. Uh, Karen, what do you think of Michael Caine in this film? Uh, he was fine, um, I, I suppose. I, I, I mean, I, Michael Caine, to a degree, seems to play the same character in most films that he's in. Um, but that, that's not to do him down. He's, he's a very kind of magnetic presence on the screen. I think what to kind of touch on a point that Paul made about Max von Sydow and, and the Nazi officer there, there's a, a kind of somewhat pleasing dynamic between him and the, the officer who sets up the game. Um, I think what Houston and, and perhaps the scriptwriters were kind of eking towards was that there was a human side to to um, you know Nazi guards or whatever who the, the kind of weight of history had, had kind of taken them along with the tide. Now, of course, that's obviously problematic in a lot of senses, but it did kind of hint at the the humanism involved and the fact that football kind of, it can um, unite people. Obviously, as we saw uh, also in, in World War One. Um, as for Kane, look, he, he plays quite a good kind of um, unifying um, officer type. Uh, he's he's obviously 
it's, it's quite funny. I just, I, I was struck by when he's doing the tactical stuff. I was like, oh my God, this just doesn't, this doesn't strike you as someone who's particularly interested in football. And I, I'd be surprised if he wasn't in some way interested in football. So I don't know if that was the, the writer's fault. Um, but he, I, I did enjoy it. And like, he kind of knits it together. Yeah, I, I would touch again on a point that you both made around the, the Stallone um kind of sidetrack into Paris and then this sort of odd loving dress that seems to sort of go nowhere as well. Um, it was very odd. It kind of took away from what was quite a, a, an interesting um, dynamic within the camp. But uh, yeah, no, he was, he was reasonably good for, uh, for the film and, and a, a good presence on screen. You mentioned Stallone there. So he is by far and away the biggest star in this movie because at the, at this point in time, 1981, he has been in two Rocky films and he's the biggest star in the world, biggest action actor in Hollywood at the minute. So it seemed an odd one that he was in this film and it turns out it was by ch uh, sheer chance that he ended up in this film. He wasn't cast in this role. Essentially what happened was he was buying a new house in Malibu and one of the producers of the show was selling the house. and. As he as he was discussing the the buying and selling of this house, he ha had this hand had to hand the script of this film, and Stallone came back a couple of days later and said, "I want to be in it." And it turns out that Stallone actually had quite uh, a strong role in the production of this film and how the storyline would go. As you can kind of see throughout the film, you can see that Stallone is. Uh, the key figure in the film, and that a lot of this, the plot is based around him, even though he's not one of the key actors or doesn't play a key role in the, in the actual game. So you have him begging to be on the team, and then you have his the also the the side story of him trying to escape from it, the uh, escape to Paris, followed by the return to the team, and then also the the big moment at the end of the game where he saves the penalty. So we'll discuss his actual acting and footballing ability in a bit. But as for the saving the penalty at the end, it turned out that he actually wanted to be the scorer of the winning goal because obviously he played a key role in the storyline. He wanted to be the key figure. He wanted to be the man with the, the big moment at the end. But the producers had to remind him that goalkeepers, they do not score goals. So he wasn't allowed to do that. So inevitably he had to have a big, have a big moment like saving the penalty. For <laughs> Throughout this film, I just thought that Stallone was playing Rocky. It was just he was playing Rocky Balboa in a football film. It was the same performance that you uh, have seen throughout his career. And he's quite irritating in this film, if I'm being quite honest. Yeah, I 100% agree. And that anecdote just sort of shows you one the clear thing is that he has having a breeze about football, which is understandable. Like, I'm, not gonna, I'm not going to uh, hit him for that one. But um, thank God, you were talking about Jesus, thank Christ they talked him down about that. And even my, my impression is even after he played the penalty, he kicked the ball away, so they're still in play. So I feel like they can, uh. just, I'm not getting, I'm not getting the football side of it yet. But just, um, yeah, I found it quite annoying as well. Like, even his first introduction, you know, when he basically rugby tackles some of the grand guys, you play the English way, I'll play the American way. He is kind of the quintessential, you know, uh, American kind of blow in with the with, with the with the arrogance and, and everything we associate with uh, America with kind of like the, the crassness and stuff like that. But I always got the vibe that Kane kind of accepted it and kind of indulged in a bit. Because he was it was the same as like he was like, I don't want to get on, I don't want to be on your team and when uh when Bobby Kane's character is going away in the car and then five minutes later he's basically begging because he wants to get in the team but when they when the team starts getting digs. It was never really established sort of any sort of familiar bond between the two characters. So I get the impression that Kane only kind of admitted him on because he wanted him to escape. But then, as I said earlier, you know, breaking his goalkeeper's arm, uh, then he gets the role as a trainer. And even as a trainer, he's basically just parroting what Colby says. And it's not it's obnoxious just hearing it back again, you know, when they get the gear and he's like, who needs this and who needs that? So he's Pretty much a bad goalkeeper, a bad trader, uh, culminates in Burke having a talent and having his arm broken. Uh, and in fairness, as a keeper, decent shot stopper. Um, true parries starting. too much. He parries way too much. Catch the ball. He's Come through that, you. He's just punching him away. He's like a modern day goalkeeper. <laughs> so but, uh, but I, I found even, I, I get the impression that I'm not too sure how tight the script was because I get the vibe that. A lot of it was maybe improv and then on the fly to give Stallone some sort of 
screen time that his Oscar win he could probably throw around a bit of weight and say I need I need a bit more dramatic angle here and there um, but as we mentioned not an awful lot of it pays off and just from hearing on the set, uh, from anecdotes on the set that him and Kane were fond of um, going to the airport every every Friday and maybe getting a flight to Paris or London for a weekend away so I'm not too sure if they're overly friendly with some of the footballers there's a story of um, in Kevin Beattie who was uh, standing in the football himself challenged Sloan to an arm wrestle and then he got the home and uh, so stuff like that it, it, it doesn't really surprise me but I mean if you want to sell the script originally and if you want to sell it overseas you need a marquee name and as you said there's no one picking Stallone at the time yeah exactly it's what made this film what gave it its stardom essentially so you, you, you will allow Stallone to take charge a little bit if he's going to make this film successful in the end. There are too many footballers to mention. We mentioned Bobby Murray, we mentioned Ozzy Ardiles, uh, but Pele is a leading actor in this film. And to be fair, he's, he's not bad. He's pretty good. Um, some of the early stuff in the film where he's talking about, he's given his background and he's from the Trinidads and it's a little bit sketchy. You're not really sure how he's going to get on. But as the film goes on and he starts talking a bit more about football, it's quite good. His acting on the ground, I thought it would have been better when he was injured because, you know, the Brazilians at that time and throughout the, throughout the ages have been known to be a little bit more dramatic when it comes to tackles. So you would have expected Pele to know how to feign an injury a little bit better. But pretty solid performance. I don't know. I, I thought, like, the, the, at the start, um, when he's first introduced and he's doing the kick-ups, um, the, the exposition from the writers is literally like, oh, well, I grew up doing this on the streets of Trinidad with an orange. And it was like, because they needed to go, yeah, lads, we know this is Pele, so just bear with us for a second while we explain why he's in the film. Um, oh, man, he's incredibly wooden. And, I, you know, I don't blame him. He's, he's not he's not an actor by trade. Um, there was an enormous amount of him doing anything footballing-wise, obviously, because the majority of the match, he's actually injured. Um, so that was was quite odd, really. Um, I, I suppose actually you can kind of look look at these. Uh, that's a kind of strange theme that obviously Pele not playing a lot of football, and then Michael Caine in a lot of the middle of the film not getting much screen time. Now I know, as you said, that Stallone had obviously been earmarked as a kind of star power, but I think that that dynamic really took away from Caine's potential to deliver some sort of performance here. Um, but yeah, I mean, a, a kind of wider theme, I suppose, of, of Pele and, and the players and their acting. Ah, it, it was it was fine because I mean, you you allow them a certain amount of leeway because they are footballers and they're not actors. Pele's uh, delivery of the lines wasn't amazing, but as you say, Paul, with the with the chalkboard when he's got the um, the chalk and he's kind of showing where he's going to run, dribble, score, etc., was quite funny. So you got to give him a pass on comic merit alone. Well, just get. <laughs> Given like the the history of his interviews, I can almost imagine Pele doing that in a World Cup dressing room before, uh, for the Brazil team. Like that, that's that's where Pele stands for me. Um, it's quite odd though because obviously Pele played in, in a period of football where not every game was on TV and there isn't actually that much footage of him playing. So you're looking at this, and this is one of the first real like color things or color films that you will see. Of Pele playing football, which is really odd. Like, I think he would have early known at the time because he would have been in the Cosmos. I think uh, when the German players scored, Bellman actually played the Cosmos as well. So at the time, they would have had you know, the big invasion. It was Beckenbauer Price. So this was uh, when soccer was just making its first in imprint in America. So I'd say his profile to the to the unknown and the maybe the, the blowing football fans who wouldn't really know him too well. I suppose a bit, a bit clever on, on the producers and get the world most famous player in. I mean, and with regards to the, the, the chalkboard, I can pretty much imagine Cristiano Ronaldo uh, saying that in part every game, he's doing the ball and do what he wants, you know. So <laughs> I don't think it's entirely beyond the, the realm of possibility. Um, but uh, yeah, I, I, I didn't mind, to be honest. And I, I think even, I think every one of the little footballers gets their time to, to, to shine. Like Mike Summerby has that line. Uh, when Michael Caine goes to him, um, do you want to play football for extra rations? He's like, oh, he's muttered out the strangle. Uh, so I think they all kind of, and John, poor John Wark was the only one because apparently his Glaswegian accent was so thick that they overdubbed his uh, his uh, voice. And he only noticed when the film actually premiered. 
that they use someone else. So um, I don't think in terms of all the footballers, I think Pele got one of the better deals in comparison to some of his teammates. Do you think he counts the bicycle kick as part of one of his 1,000 goals? It wouldn't, it wouldn't be like him. Uh, now, moving on to the Germans, and I suppose there's only one real key role when it comes to the, the Nazi team or the Nazi players, and that's Major Karl von Steiner, which is a great name for uh, a German Nazi. He's played by uh, Max von Sydow, who is quite a good actor. I think he plays this role quite well. Um, I don't really want to touch on the British officers because they are in and out of the film, but they're, they're, it's just you could pick any British officers from any war film and dub them into this movie and they'd fit quite well. What, we've already touched on the sort of humanistic side to the Nazis, and that's something that is portrayed in quite a few war films. But just based on uh, von Steiner's performance, how did you rate it? Yeah, I think right from the right from the intro, he's not kind of portrayed as the kind of the twiddling mustache um, evil Nazi. Although we do get brief glimpses of uh, one of his higher high officers has an eye patch. So you know, whenever you see someone with an eye patch in the movie, they're probably evil. And I do, do think we got one of those on um, Bismarck twirling um, Nazi cliches that we're kind of used to seeing. But right from the off, he kind of tr- treats Kane, uh, Kane starts probably with respect. He talks about football. He says, um, he talks to the sympathy and says, it's horrible that your career has ended. And Michael Kane, he says, briefly interrupted. Uh, so in other films, you know, given cheek to uh, Nazi officer if you're a POW, he'll probably get you, in the, get you punished or something like that. But he, he kind of goes along with it. So right from the off, you're established the character dynamics with each other as equals. Um, I do think that he he's such a strong actor. I mean, you know from the Exorcist and uh, Game of Thrones fans, you know, almost a three-eyed Raven, that he does convey the empathy and uh, his altruistic kind of spirit of football and that has to be played in the best way, as you see, when the Pele goal goes in. And even the kind of shock and awe when he learns that the referee has uh, has been bribed um, so that the, the Nazis win. Um, it, it isn't the cartoon character, but Again, I did have an issue that I don't think an awful lot was made of just the harsh conditions of why they wanted to escape. It's, it's not that type of film, you know, it really is. It's, a, it's an escape, it's three o'clock film that you go with. But um, again, I, I still don't think there's any escape in that, you know, he is an athlete. Um, so for me, it was well acted, but maybe not enough peril for the. And I know that you can see someone get uh, shot in the very first game, but. You don't really see how it affects the players personally. Like, for example, if there's a scene when they take someone out and Sloan gets thrown in the box, but well, he deserves to get thrown in the box because he escaped and he came back. Um, but there's not an awful lot of um, I don't know how to say it. They're, they're out here in prison for war, but there's not a lot of jeopardy in their private life before the match goes on. Aside from obviously being yeah, I agree, and I mean they do try to sort of excuse it a little bit in the script when they're talking about how. Some of the Germans think that the war is already over, and as do the, the the players or the prisoners of war at the time. Michael Caine mentions uh, earlier on in the film that, you know, the the players just want to do their time and be done with it and finish off the war healthy and and, and alive essentially. But I, I would agree there's not enough um, emphasis on how bad the Nazis actually were in this film, and even. Von Steiner himself, uh, there's not enough jeopardy, jeopardy for him if this goes wrong for him because he's the one that's setting this up. And even though one of the players escapes, he still isn't really punished by his higher-ranking officials and um, they don't really portray the Nazis as a sort of a strong force, which is probably done on purpose as well because this is coming to the sort of midpoint of the war where the, the Nazis are struggling. Uh, I do want to talk about the plot and talk about that Paris scene now because... Essentially, for those who haven't seen the film, what ha- what's happened is Stallone wants to escape from the camp this, this whole time, but he finally gets his chance. He escapes to Paris, and he's sent there by British officials to meet with the resistance, and basically they want to plan to help this football team escape once they are done with this match or once they get at least half of the game done. And he stays at a stays in a, a shelter with a young woman who is a weird sort of weird sidetrack to the even sidetrack of the plot because they just try to insert this love interest for no particular reason. I think that was probably just a Hollywood technique at that time. But 
the plot itself doesn't finish out because, yes, the resistance do help him, but they help him by saying, you need to go back to the prison uh, with, the, with the other prisoners, go to the match as normal, and then we will help you escape through tunnels underneath the stadium. And the prisoners do go to the match, they go to the, they go to the stadium, and the resistance do dig through the tunnels. But that's not actually how they escape. So essentially, that plot dragged on for about 20, 25 minutes of the film and reached no particular conclusion. So, Paul, I know you have already raised issue with this. Kieran, what's your thoughts on it? It's totally redundant. Like the, the, the whole, uh, the kind of scales fell from my eyes a little bit when you said that Stallone had had a big input into the uh, into the script because you can imagine him just effectively crafting an action scene, an escape scene for himself. Like I, I, I must admit, I sort of mentally checked out for about ten minutes, and, uh, but when I was when I was back in, I was like, why is he why is he climbing over the shower and clambering out of this and all sorts? So it, it was mad, and also like it. I understand that you need a kind of subplot or a bit of peril, as Paul said, or, or, or something along those lines, but it just seems so um, uh, so stupid, really. Like, the, and particularly given the fact that during the match, spoiler alert, there's, they go into the bath and they see that there are bubbles rising and then eventually it becomes clear that the people are tunnelling from underneath and, and ready to kind of uh, spring them from, from Nazi prison ship. But, like... It, at the end of the film, so they go out there for the second half, and at the end of the film, I'm kind of like scanning how long we've got left to see what the kind of, you know, the resolution of this will be, and then the film just ends. So, like, I suppose it's um, it, it's a bit of a, a signal to directors and, and actors, and I, the relationship between a director and a lead actor for, for future reference to basically say, listen, we're the ones who write the scripts, you stick to the acting, we'll do this, like we'll craft the, the film as best we can because that's what we do. You're the actor. Now, obviously, there are people that are skilled for that, but, but I mean, Stallone just absolutely murders the middle part of this film. Like, it, it, it's so it's so out of, um, out of time, and it, it's just... It's it's kind of unnecessary because the as you know as we talked about there's there's no real peril there anyway like you know they they're, they're not under uh, threat of of being shot or something if they lose the game so I don't know it it really it was a big black mark against the film for me and it's all entirely dependent on that child coming onto the pitch before the game with the flowers to tell Stallone the break out was a half time so we're not going to pick holes through everything but that's a pretty big one. So if that kid doesn't get onto the pitch, isn't in the ground, <laughs> isn't tackled by a steward, I presume there were stewards back then, and also uh, at half-time, there's a scene when the majors, the English majors, kind of see the Allies coming back onto the pitch and they look at themselves like, well, bloody hell, like, it's gone. They were prisoners too, those two kind of dandy officers. So how did they know the breakout was paid for half-time? Because it was the French element of the resistance that only those alone to the kid with the flowers. Mm. Yeah, that's yeah. We be here all day. Yeah, yeah. it's yeah. it's a need, it's a needless point because essentially they just escape using the the crowd who run onto the pitch, overpowering the Nazi army with guns and dogs. It's it was a, a real miracle, a real miracle that this ever happened. But if we're picking holes in every plot of every film, then you can you eventually lead with you, you end up with nothing. So I I, I thought. Overall, the plot of this film is quite good. I do want to talk about the actual football in this film because, after all, this is a football show and we have picked holes at every other football film for the football acting. So we'll take a quick break there. Coming up after the break, we will get in-depth with the football. Now, welcome back to Team 33 and a call here with you. I'm joined on the line by Kieran Bradley and Paul Moore because we are talking about Escape to Victory, the 1981 film starring Sylvester Stallone and Michael Caine and Pelle, as I mentioned earlier on, and Bobby Moore and Ozzy Ardiles and several other professional or semi-professional footballers at this time because most of the people who are in this film are bordering on retirement or have retired already. Uh, lads, so the climax of this movie, it is the football match between the Nazis and the Allied prisoners of war. Um, first of all, the referee, you know, you may forget about him as a man because he, he was paid off by those Nazis, 100%. 
Yeah, there was um, the, the, the disallowed goal um, contains the most egregious back pass I've ever seen on a football pitch. The, there's a German defender who passes about four yards back in his own in his own box, and they deserve to be punished for that. So the referee for that alone is, as you say, is forgotten as a man. The football itself. So the Germans. We we do know that the German uh, team have several German internationals on it. So. You're, you're expecting them to be better than Allied Prisoners of War who are former players and haven't really been training properly. So you expect them to probably dominate the game somewhat. But if it wasn't for Sylvester Stallone's horrific goalkeeping at the start, it probably wouldn't have been 3-0 uh, going into this game. We'll talk about further on how realistic the, the comeback is, but Stallone's goalkeeping alone in this, in this film, how he goes from not being able to stop anything jumping in two-footed, which will also touch on some of the tackles in this film. But his goalkeeping's all over the place. You wouldn't trust him to guard your net at all. Paul, what's your thoughts on Sloan? Would you believe that Gordon Banks apparently was uh, on set as the goalkeeping advisor for Sylvester Stallone, and apparently, shock, shock, he didn't pay that much attention to him, and I think it shows. I mean, as I said, right from the off, with the rugby tackle in the player, you know this guy doesn't get it, but I mean... Not even knowing where to stand for a corner, and they made such a big deal out of that. That you know, going into the game, he didn't even know. I mean, I don't know where to start between between his technique of just calming stuff out straight back into goal, um, tackling with his feet insistently. And I know David De Gea is kind of invented to using your feet as a keeper, but this is just completely different stuff going on altogether. He is horrific. Um, uh, well, in a weird way, it kind of does capture that period of football because goalkeepers were battered, basically. It was a free-for-all if they went into a box. So, you know, you have uh, stories of keepers like Bernd Chapman and all that stuff playing on with injuries. So, in that sense, it's a bit realistic. And I think uh, it's never enough to afford that when you see them play football for the start, they're on these terrible uh, pitches in the POW. So you kind of give them some sort of artistic license to have bad football and to have it like a, basically just a legalised version of a Royal Rumble um, but when it actually gets to the main match I think even like the, the, the ceremony and the build up to it that will be touched the anthems they actually, I think they actually played out the anthems pretty pretty, pretty fully uh, they got to the stadium with their MTK Budapest and they for Colombia and Paris which is where the 1938 World Cup was played so it's fairly it's fairly decent for like the small details like that but um Stallone, yeah, he's got an awful lot to apologise for Kevin McCallum because he got a raw deal. Not even a goalkeeper in real life, and then gets one of the most famous leg breaks, or sorry, arm breaks, they say, in cinema history, all for a poor trainer and a keeper who was a liability from the off and would inspire no problems in his back four. Yeah, it was a disgraceful decision to to, to drop him and put Stallone in this because he had no, he had no. I don't know, credibility, he, he had no trust, he, he was going to escape, he was going to leave at half time for God's sake. He shouldn't have been an S in the first he place. He reminded me, sorry, he reminded me, if you remember when Boris Johnson was at Soccer Age <laughs> and he absolutely clambers into your mind, like, that was what he was like coming out of his area. He was such a busy goalkeeper, it's disgraceful. The slide tackles in this film, there could have been, I know this is the 80s, <laughs> or, or I know it's, it's set in the 40s, but I mean, for God's sake, there could have been at least five red cards in this film. It was disgraceful stuff. In fairness, Charles would have been happy with a few. Colby uh, was training there, and they love a good. I don't know what it is about Hollywood. They love a good right tackle montage. And having played up to about let's say senior level, I don't think I've ever really had slide tackling drills in my life. And that was I I, 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 that was interesting to me actually because I've never seen a team train just slide tackling. Yeah, well, maybe coaching's changed since very. I play, but I don't think I've ever heard someone who go past the side back of like these practice set pieces and stuff. But geez, Ozzy Ardila gets some amount of thumps in this film. I mean, fair face, he keeps going. I, <laughs> I know it's a fair world of dinner and, and this style of play, he does invite the knots. But Jesus Christ, he gets lumped around this pitch. And for me, he's the MVP. I know he gives himself, he's the one who gives the penalty away the last bit. But uh, yeah, Ozzy man the match for me just for pure bloody mind and pick himself up off the pitch and keep going. Does Michael Caine have enough role uh, to play in this football match? Because they build him up to be, you know, former West Ham player 
and he's a trainer, he's a manager, he's a captain, he's calling everyone else terrible in training. But he doesn't have a key role in this game. He doesn't play a key pass, he doesn't go on a, a dribbly run. Like it, it was, was it because Michael Caine was so bad at football that they, they thought they just couldn't get enough out of him to, to fill in that kind of role? I imagine so, because he, um, he he's not in it in any footballing capacity at all. And like if you, it's kind of where the him and Bobby Moore comparison comes up again, because he's almost there as a kind of talismanic leader. He's he's only, at the, I mean, there's one point obviously during the penalty where, where he's explaining to this Lyle Stallone that he has to save the penalty. That's his role as a goalkeeper. So. Um, yeah, it was slightly strange. I, I, just to come back to one point that Paul made about Ozzy Ardiles as well, it, he really reminded you. Remember when you see these footage from like the forties or whatever, and it kind of it, it speeds up and slows down, and you've got these really busy footballers in kind of long shorts. Ozzy Ardiles has got that such kind of quick feet that he always looks like he's kind of in one and a half speed the whole time, so he kind of suits it quite well, and he's got the little kind of side parting as well. Um, overall, I think the, the 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 football was it was kind of immersive. Really, it was like there's always something going on. As a football fan, you're always going to have a good bit to be able to pick out as criticism. But I did quite enjoy it. And I did as this little flick over the head. I was like, oh, you gotta gotta love a bit of that. It yeah. came to nothing though. Nothing Beach. came off that. <laughs> Bobby Moore headers the ball in slow motion, and it goes nowhere. The header that ruins it. The flick alone. Yeah, exactly. And the little that header was from nothing. Like, no, it was it was pointless. I was I I actually I loved the flick over the head. I was like, oh, that's brilliant. Didn't expect to see that in this film. And then Bobby Moore just headers it for no reason. Yeah. It's so bizarre. What about well, Pe- what about Pele in this uh, football match? Is he is he given enough role in this? Because I know he's injured for quite a bit. But even the scenes where he is in it, he's tackled quite a bit, which is quite interesting. They're not really playing up the role that this this guy is Pele. He's the best player on the planet at the minute. Well, I suppose there was a little bit when he carried on the injury and he was uh, being tightly marked. Uh, marked is a very loose use of the word because he's getting punched in the stomach repeatedly. It looked like he was trying to dribble around and then he went around his man with a cheek and that night. Um, I, yeah, I'm curious about that because aside from the fact that the Allies scored three goals with 10 men, I would say from an American, if you were, if you were not familiar with the rules of football, I would say they were probably thinking it was like a rotation roll on with a buff type format. It wasn't particularly clear to me that they were playing with 10 men for a long time, unless you completely, unless you're completely aware of the rules of football, because I don't even think the substitute rule was invented by them. Um, so it, was, it is peculiar. Uh, but I have to say, just on the football, watching it again, I was, obviously you remember the play overhead kick, but the Bobby Moore goal is an absolute peach. And yeah. the prototype from sweeper. Building from the back, carrying his run up, lovely one too, and just the timing of the run, it was a lovely goal. And the way it's filmed is from that kind of high, high up angle, the bird's eye view. Ford, I, I'm not sure how they did, probably a crane or something like that, but the camera angles for the match are really, really good. And it's something we talked about a bit before another film film. It's very, football is very, very hard to film. But I think, obviously, it helps that he had 18 internationals playing the game. I actually think, aside from the stupid edit of the Aussie flick, I think they actually do a really good job of capturing the movement of footballer. And also, a big thing is technique and how footballers actually swing their foot and boot. Uh, and I mean, as for the Ardila, so I actually you get the sense that this is like the, you're watching an actual match. So yeah. I, I think it's really, really good. Yeah. And now I'm going to talk about the Murphy Eds at the end because that just brings goosebumps because that anthem is the greatest, maybe next to Uruguay's never uh, sang loudly. Marseille at full blast is goosebumps. They um they they don't sing those kind of songs at football matches enough anymore. That that would that was a great it would have been a great football anthem right now, but I, I do agree with you in, in large parts of that because if you look at the Pele goal as an example, the Pele bicycle kick, if we, we spoke about goal and how bad the technique was in that when it came to filming, and I suppose you do have to remember this was filmed in the eighties, so they're basing this off the eighties game, and I actually thought it looked quite like some of the football matches from the 80s. But Pele's bicycle kick, to this day, I don't know if there's a better goal that has been filmed in a football film in, in terms of the cross looking accurate because it was Bobby Murray kicking the ball 
and you also had Pele doing the bicycle kick, so he knows what the technique is supposed to look like. And I know it's probably unrealistic that that would happen, but from a purely technique standpoint, it was actually quite good. Yeah, it was it was outstanding technically. Like I, I'd be interested to know how many takes that took. Um, and I, I was trying to kind of in real time when they were kind of replaying it in slow motion from a different angle. I was I was actually trying to figure out whether that was the same one. Um, but look, I mean, it, it, if we kind of go back to what was hinted at at the start, in that a lot of this is uh, aimed at potentially an American audience with uh, Stallone and otherwise. And something like that is is pretty much the most spectacular technical feat that you can pull off on a football pitch. So it's definitely going to wow a, a few people. And um, yeah, it, it was it was very well done. I'd agree with Paul's point about the the relatively true to life um, reflection of of what football was like at that stage. Like it, as you said, it is very difficult to actually encapsulate the the chaos and the the tactical kind of nous of both teams in in any uh, in any one period on film so no i was i was happy enough with it and and i think the 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 bicycle kit was probably the apotheosis of that for sure i even like the chaotic energy of this loud goal because that's how this loud goal matches nobody knows what's going on everyone's angry they don't know what's happening they turn the lines and, and they probably get it wrong i even think that was i wouldn't be surprised if the footballers like probably more than i spoke to on the side if you listen this is how it's done and um, maybe pulled rank in a way that Stallone may have pulled rank to maybe get himself a bit more dramatic change. But in this case, I would be more in favour of footballers doing it. Yeah, it it's definitely is a nice touch that you have these professional footballers in this film and that they play a key role in it as well because that is the key aspect to this and making it a believable football match. We're running out of time, lads, so I will get your... Um, your rankings out of this before we start that Rotten Tomatoes have given us 63% and it has 6.7 on IMDb Paul I'll let you start because this is what as you said this is a film that you've watched all the time what would you give it out of 10? Uh, out of 10 I was going to go out of 100 I'd give it a 75 so let's be I'd give it a, I'd give it a 7 out of 10 just because I still regard the Damn United as the best football film I've seen but I still think for pure enjoyment escapism and it's nostalgia, and as you start the show saying, when else are you going to get a film with Michael Caine, Sylvester Stallone, Ozzy Ardile, and Pele together? Uh, and that's so, for nostalgia alone, I'll give it a seven out of ten. Had a push, seven and a half. Kieran? Uh, I'm gonna go. I was gonna go with maybe a five and a half, but I'll push it up to a six. Um, for the main reason that uh, Sylvester Stallone uh, gives a team talk where he references anal bleeding in the most odd uh, team talk I've ever heard, so that gives it an extra half a point. Um, it is actually a, a pretty good film, all told. The the plot is uh, kind of sags in the middle. Um, and as I say, you kind of have to take into account that most football films aren't especially good. Uh, so given this was quite a decent mix of war and uh, uh, the Second World War and football and um, has the star power of Kane, Stallone, Pelé, etc. Yeah, I'll, I'll go for a six. That is the first and last time anal bleeding will be mentioned on the show as a key point. <laughs> I... <laughs> I, I actually enjoyed. It's so bizarre. I actually enjoyed it's that so scene. Bizarre. I enjoyed that scene because that was classic Stallone. You know the whole mumbling idiot sort of trying to be funny and nobody's really listening to him. That's where I actually thought this guy is just playing Rocky Balboa. Like that's that that is the still the style of acting he uses in that film as well. I um I I'm going to score this on the lower side as well. I'm going to go for a six six out of ten because um I don't think it's as good as the other films that we've uh, seen so far. It does have some nostalgia aspect to it. It is a good sort of mix between a football film and a wire film. And it does make you feel sort of warm inside at the end of it, even though it is sort of as a plot, it doesn't really make sense at the end. Um, it, Paul, as you said, it's a, it's a perfect three o'clock matinee that you might see uh, on the big, big movie at Christmas time on the RTE, if that still exists. I don't know if it does with Netflix. Does it exist? Is that still a thing? I don't know. Tweet us and let us know at Off The Ball. We'll take a quick break there. Lads, take, uh, take it easy. Thanks for coming on.